and advance warning, I um, have a bad cold, so I may lose my voice um, halfway through. I'll then click you through my slides and take questions and answer them with eloquent hand gestures. Incomprehensible, but eloquent. Uh, so let's get going. I'm going to begin by doing a declaration of interests. Um, and I dislike the way I have formatted it, because it creates a binary um, where I think actually there should be a hybrid in many crossovers. But um, I'm invested both in the traditional uh, book publishing um, edifice, and I'm also deeply invested in the open access book publishing edifice. Um, on the left, I've noted uh, two Cambridge University Press monographs. They made my career. Um, I'm deeply grateful uh, to the press for publishing them and doing it for free, from my perspective. Um, I've been the co-editor of three uh, Cambridge monograph series. I'm doing uh, modern British histories now, including with uh, Peter Mandler on the editorial team. And again, I think that's a good thing. I enjoy that. I love seeing new books um, come into the public domain. Um, the Royal Historical Society um, has, though it is uh, completing in 2020, a monograph series, Studies in History, uh, founded by G.R. Elton in 1975, currently published by Boydell and Brewer, and under Boydell and Brewer will have brought out um, over 100 first monographs of early career historians, and I think we're all very proud of that series. And then I've published chapters and had uh, PhD students who have published with MUP and Palgrave and um, the usual suspects. Then on the open access um, side, I also have vested interests. Um, obviously, and this will be the bulk of my talk today, uh, the Royal Historical Society's New Historical Perspectives, which is um, launching in autumn 2019. I am holding one of our first uh, four titles um, here. You can look at it, touch it, open it, even read bits of it um, later on if you uh, novel me. Um, uh, and as I say, that will be the bulk of my presentation. I'm also the co-editor of a large 500-page uh, university um, UCL uh, press open access book. I'll talk about that in my next slide. That came out in February 2018. And I am also on the editorial executive of UCLP. So I am invested um, in particular models, too, in particular. And then uh, recently, at the end of his Marie Curie Fellowship, um, Professor Fabrice um, Ben-Simon, who was working with me at UCL, and I got um, an open access contract with OUP for his not yet written uh, forthcoming monograph. So I can also talk about that. It's a good example of the sorts of decisions you have to make with the book processing charge, the BPC model. We had to decide, do we want to spend 12,000 pounds doing research, or do we want to spend about 12,000 pounds paying for research that's already been done to be open access? And I think that's an important um, point about the current funding models that we have, which are deeply problematic. So the presentation is going to follow this format, and I'm going to try and leave 10 minutes at least at the end for questions and discussion. I'm going to start with the question of why do open access um, publishing and the humanities, I'm hopefully will be quick like a little bunny there, because I think most of the people in the room understand what, why some of the reasons um, are for doing that. I want to talk a little bit about why the Royal Historical Society took a perfectly good traditional monograph series and killed it off, or is in the process of killing it off, to go open access. Talk to you a little bit about the content and the purpose of that um, series, how it's funded, uh, what the known unknowns are about um, our own series. And then I want to widen that out to the wider monograph um, landscape, focusing predominantly on um, humanities, which is what I know a little bit about. And then, as I say, hopefully we'll have time for questions and answers. So shameless self-promotion, -pr that's my own open access book. And I'm just going to use it to illustrate why it's a no-brainer that in a universe where money was free, uh, staffing didn't matter, um, and sustainability was inevitable, we would all be doing this sort of thing. Um, we published about a year and a half ago. We're just under 40,000 downloads. Um, and those downloads, interestingly, started out being predominantly in Northern Europe and North America, but increasingly India, Pakistan, uh, Asia Pacific um, has been picking up, and now Pakistan is the fourth most likely place to be downloading, particularly pertinent at the moment when, because of the Kashmir crisis, 
Um, most uh, books coming from UK publishers get into Pakistan via India, and that has been completely cut off during the Kashmir <coughs> crisis. So open can do really interesting things in that sort of context, and I am completely aware of that, and I think it's one of the real virtues of this model. Format is something we perhaps don't think enough about. Um, monographs are really, really important in the humanities for career development, for critical thinking, um, but uh, edited volumes are also really, really important. They're one of the ways that we hone our research and get it out there, and I think um, open access is particularly well suited for the co-edited volume, which is what this is. And the co-edited volume often sits very um, uncomfortably within the con uh, traditional landscape, uh, landscape of publishing. Who's going to buy it? Is it going to get reviewed? In my field in history, co-edited volumes get reviewed much less frequently than other things. So open may work particularly better. And JSTOR obviously helps. Uh, finally, teachability um, is something I think we don't talk about enough. We talk about the research monograph and the research volume. This is certainly a research volume. My sense from anecdotal evidence is the reason our download numbers are so high is it's being used to teach undergraduates and master's students. I know it's been taught to undergraduates in Bangladesh and at Lincoln University. I know it's been used for master's students in the Heritage Program at Derby. And I know it's been used for fee-paying students at the VNA. There's a great irony there because we could not afford, because of image problems, image licensing and costs, to put a single VNA image into the volume. Uh, that's going to be a recurrent theme, I'm sure. So why convert to this? We're a learned society, and um, I think one of the things that learned society should be for is experimentation. So entering into this space of experimentation is completely compatible with what a good learned society should be doing and should be thinking about. Um, and that's precisely what we've done. And I can certainly think of other examples of Chinese studies, Japanese studies, history of science, learned organizations that have also tried to experiment through open access. And I think that's thoroughly what we should be doing. We're also a charity. So making a profit is not something that we need to do. Crucially, we do need revenue to do anything that we do. But uh, we can do a lost leader, which is frankly what I think the series is going to be for us. And then finally, the great bulk of our discretionary income goes to promote early career research. And I think there is an argument that uh, the open format is particularly beneficial to early career historians. I've already got a reputation. People will read my next book, even if I bring it out, as I plan to do as a Cambridge University Press expensive book. Um, that's not necessarily the case for somebody entering into my discipline. So I think that if we need to make choices about who we pay for, paying for early career researchers to have open access books is where I would prioritize my funding. So let's have a look at the series itself. Um, unlike studies in history, the monograph series um, that we are uh, re removing from our list, uh, New Historical Perspectives includes both co-edited volumes and also monographs, and I think that was a good move, recognizing the importance in knowledge production of the co-edited volume. And the last speaker, obviously, was referring to that as well. All of our authors are early career researchers. We define that very generously within 10 years of the PhD. Um, if you know anything about the humanities precariat, you know that a very good person might be scrambling around for three or four years before they go into a quasi-permanent or permanent post. So a long durée for early career was something we favored. If it's a co-edited volume, at least one of the editors has to be an ECR, and I think that's a good principle and would fight for that if I had to, which I don't. Um, and then one of the real value adds of the model that we've got um, is that the uh, uh, individual authors are all assigned a member of the editorial board closest to their field of study, who is a mentor throughout the process. When they have a revised full manuscript, we then pay to workshop it. So that one of the series editors, there are two series editors, together with the assigned editorial board mentor, together with two external experts, are brought in over an afternoon to workshop the text. And then the author has two things. They have four sets of acute commentary on their already revised book manuscript. They also have four serious individuals who can write for them. Um, 
for the job market, for grant applications, et cetera. We think that is value added. And again, that's something uh, learned societies and the editorial process more broadly is meant to be doing, and we think we do it. So, so far we've had, it's actually 30 now. I talked to the administrative secretary last night, 30 submissions. We've accepted about half of them, rejected uh, just under half of them. Three have either been um, withdrawn or not resubmitted after we gave them a revised and resubmitted peer review. Again, we do engage very actively in the process of trying to enhance the quality of the products that are brought to us. Um, I think when we were starting out, um, there wasn't a University of London Press label attached to the series. I think that gave some ECRs, understandably, uh, pause or concern because their um, mentors or senior managers were telling them you need to publish with a university press. Well, we're now a university press. I don't think that was a major disincentive, but I think that moving to the University of London imprimatur is going to be a help. Um, so far as we can tell, demand is exceeding supply, and supply is constrained really by two things, by funding and capacity issues. And I'll return to those in a moment. Um, the first four books, um, we're delighted to say, are now in production and will be coming out um, within a month and then in, over the next few months. We're hoping to have eight out, excuse me, <coughs> um, by the REF deadline. And I think that's a tremendous achievement. Um, very much enhanced by our collaborators at the Institute of Historical Research and at the School of Advanced Studies in the University of London, and uh, some really um, generous, visionary, um, and hard-headed uh, editors. Uh, we started out with Simon Newman and Penny Summerfield from Glasgow and um, Manchester Universities. We now have um, Jane Winters and Heather Shaw um, as our editorial senior editors, and they're just wonderful. The format is absolutely the same quality of any good university press that you would be publishing with, and importantly, that extends to the images. So I tried to pick off a page proof to give you a sense there. This does not look some as dark. It doesn't feel some as dark. It's not some as dark. It's good, proper quality publishing. Now, if you can read the very small print on how is New Historical Perspectives funded, I've chosen a Goya print, and it's entitled by the... Um, uh, curator, prostitute soliciting a fat, ugly man, and I've chosen that advisedly. Um, so authors in our series, and this is an absolutely crucial element, they pay no book prices in charge. Uh, the IHR, SAS, and RHS absorb um, the full cost. The only exception to that, and this is only something we've picked up really as we've gone into production, is um, we didn't initially offer anything for image costs. Um, what I've been doing as a short-term solution to that is we have a generous uh, annual donor uh, who is very pro-OA, and at the moment I've simply set that money aside for paying for image licensing for authors. That's not going to cover 100% of the images that are needed or wanted, but it goes some distance toward it. It's not sustainable um, if we lose um, donations. Uh, the, probably the bulk of uh, money that we get in the Royal Historical Society comes from annual subscriptions of members and fellows. We also have an investment portfolio which delivers the next largest chunk. Um, and then donations are another major chunk. Very important that Past and Present Society and Economic History Society are both supporting us. What are they supporting us from? Well, they're supporting us from the revenues of their journals. So Plan S will have consequences if it comes about for um, what we can do in the uh, monograph sphere in terms of open access. We also benefit at the moment, and we know this will die out, from Cambridge's um, digitization of our backlist for um, another of our book series and our journal. So I'm expecting at the moment, and we don't, we don't yet know, we're too early in this process, but I'm expecting that new historical perspectives will lose us um, more money than studies in history lost us, and that's obviously a concern. Uh, but we're in a, in a place, and I think it's our role to be experimenting with this um, at the moment. So what are the known unknowns? Finances, as I've just indicated, um, we know this is a problem. Is NHP going to be financially viable over the long term? That worries me a lot. Not because I think we're going to crash out of the market in the next five years. Um, something would something really bad to the market would have to happen for that to be the case, and which may, of course, happen. More worrying is the fact that we have very little discretion within our budget. Um, we have a skeletal um, staff. If 
We need to find additional resources to do this. Realistically, it's either going to mean killing off a postdoctoral fellowship, so killing off an opportunity for an early career researcher to have a year-long fellowship, or it's going to mean that we take the 50 to 60K we spend each year to send over 200 students to archives or to conferences to produce research. We're going to have to cut into that budget in order to publish one or two people's research open access. And that, that's a real bind um, that worries me a great deal. A second major concern, and I don't think it's come up quite as much as it uh, might, though it's been mentioned by both of the previous um, authors, previous speakers, is infrastructure. We don't have a good, stable infrastructure for doing what we're doing. Um, we're working very happily and very collaboratively with uh, SAS, with the School of Advanced Studies, and with IHR. Anyone who knows anything about the past two decades of those organizations knows that every five years there's a panic about whether they will continue to be funded by Research England um, or whether they will continue to have the levels of income they have. So it's very vulnerable, I think, at that level. Scalability. I don't think our model is scalable. It isn't really intended to be scalable. We're doing something different. The four mentors commenting on a complete manuscript of a book. Scalable? No, not scalable. Good, it's a really good thing to be doing, but I don't think we are the model that you would be following if you were trying to get every ref volume published open access. And again, I think learned societies can do these wacky experiments that allow you to think about what would utopia look like, but then we have to think about the fact we don't live in utopia. We need to do something better than that. And then finally, and this again has come very much out of our experience with our authors, um, the precarity of these authors and the small scale of what we're doing means that that perennial problem that any editor recognizes, which is authors run late, um, has knock-on consequences for us because of our small scale and the fact that our authors, they're on eight-month contracts here and there. They're on multiple contracts all over the place. They're having to move to a new city to take up a, a fixed-term contract teaching fellowship, find a flat even though they don't have an income. They're running late, entirely understandably. And that makes it even more difficult to do what we're doing. I don't know how to underline the importance of getting at the particular place of precarity that we're at in the moment. Um, I'm an eternal optimist. I always think that the glass is three quarters full. But the, the situation in which ECRs are at at the moment is very, very difficult. And it's impacting upon their publication possibilities. So what are the unresolved issues? Um, here I have five over two slides. Um, who is invited to the table? I think this is an absolutely central question. We have to be asking ourselves, who will pay for the meal? Are all authors going to be invited to publish open access and enabled and allowed to do so? Or is it going to be all authors of given institutions, the UCL Press model, which is one I'm invested in, one I believe in, um, is, uh, gives free open access publishing if you are at UCL, and then a small number of um, open access books to others. So I entirely understand why we do that. We can't afford to pay for everyone in the UK to be open access. But on the other hand, that's quite different than my experience with my two Cambridge monographs. I've never had uh, the relationship of it being an employee at, at Cambridge. Any time I've even been approached, I've said, no way, Jose. Um, Peter laughs because he knows this is true. Um, but that's had no implications whatsoever for CUP publishing my books. And I think that's really something we have to think about very hard. Um, uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion, or exclusion. Uh, the resounding silence that greets this every time I raise it is, well, it's resounding. Um, this is a really, really serious issue. If we don't understand the funding regimes, if we don't understand the barriers and obstacles that underpin scholarship today, we're going to get open access badly wrong. And I would remind all of us, a bit like Lady Hale, we do live under the rule of law, and that rule of law includes the Equality Act 2010. And I think we've got to get grips around that fact. There is no legislation that mandates open access as a human right in the UK or elsewhere in the world. I get the vision. I entirely get the vision. But we need to take statutory uh, 
requirements in terms of equality into account when we think through how to do open access properly. It's not clear to me that that's happening, and that's very worrying. So, um, which licenses? You've already heard a lot about this, so I won't go into it into any detail. I did publish a my UCL book, CC BY. Um, I recognize the reasons that many humanities and social science scholars in particular are concerned about CC BY. I think we need to take those concerns seriously. They're real. Um, even though I myself chose to um, hold my nose and go CC BY. Um, uh, more importantly, however, is the fact that the repositories make it extraordinarily difficult to publish um, uh, books with images that are integral to the text, open access. And it, as I say, with our volume, it changed what we illustrated, which changes the argument, because I could not rest um, of images from the V&A that I could also pay for. So we had over, we had 100 images. Um, I never want to copyright clear for open access 100 images ever again. Shoot me if I suggest that I want to do this. It's, it's evil. But it's also obscenely expensive, and we couldn't have done it if, unless the two co-editors had had generous research accounts. A scale and sustainability. Um, is OA book production scalable within current UK academic staffing models? Staffing is really, really important. I don't think it is. And I think we have to think through the entire production process. It's got to be cradle to publisher. It's got to go all the way through knowledge production through to the publishing process. I think that most of the OA debates that I attend, they start much too late in the cycle. And that's also one of the reasons that they don't think seriously about the equality, diversity, inclusion issues as well. Really important to note that. The other is about the internationality of scholarship. Um, I think it's really surprising that it's very easy to illustrate that open access readership can be and should be global. And that's one of the important things that OA should be doing. But it's really surprising when you look at it at how local the OA production of books is. And I think we need to get our heads around that. Um, I think um, in Martin Eve's presentation um, did speak to some of those issues. And it's obviously related, I think, to funding. Is, is there uh, one of the problems. Um, getting a sustainable, scalable model that is international and global is going to be a really difficult thing to do. Um, I don't think we're anywhere near there yet. Um, I would love us to be, but let's be frank, we're not. So I hope I have left six, seven, eight minutes for questions and discussions and comments, not any missiles thrown at me. I don't know a lot about the RHS. Um, is there any effect, or do you anticipate any effect on membership through having the series available open access? That is, people cease to become members because they can read it open access if they have access at the moment because they're members. Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm going to give you um, the one fact I have about membership and open access, and then I'm going to tell you that fact is not, I think, meaningful. So the one fact I have is that I have had one extremely irate fellow who resigned from the fellowship because we were shifting from a traditional monograph series to open access. He then continued to explain to me that this meant that there would be no hard copy and you know, mothers would be killed and apple pie would be interdicted. And there was, it was a complete misapprehension of what open access was and why we were doing it. Um, so um, the only fact I have is kind of not a fact in, 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 a, in a useful sense. Um, we're unusual in that we draw much less of our income from our publishing than almost any other history learned society in the UK, and there are over 30 of them. The Historical Association, which largely deals with schools, and the RHS, which is more university-based, though we also have people in the heritage sector, for example, we draw a much lower proportion of our income from publishing. And most of that is attached to our journal, not to the monograph series. So I don't particularly think it will, but I also think we are completely unrepresentative of the learned society landscape. I think this is a really interesting model focusing on early career researchers, but I've heard some 
I've heard some criticism among colleagues that feel that having having the serious focus on the work of your early career researchers basically puts them in a, into a sort of ghetto that, oh, the early career researcher, they just put their work online, it's not a real book, whereas the established scholar, they get to publish with Oxford or Cambridge or whatever, mm. what have mm. you. Um, obviously, that's not the intent, so what would you, how would you respond to that criticism? Yeah, I think that's a criticism that actually I've known about for decades now when Bob Darnton did his project, which because I'm elderly, I'm going to forget the name of, Gutenberg, was it, in the US? Um, that was precisely the uh, comment that people made. They said, why doesn't Bob Darnton do the first book in this series? Um, we can't afford to do more books than we're already doing. And we've had a long track record with bringing out first books with additional editorial experience. And this is true of studies that um, people were assigned a mentor who gave them much more editorial intervention in the process of production. That's what we do now. People can go elsewhere and have, have an editor who hasn't even read the first paragraph of the book, or they can come to us where four really quite serious historians who we've vetted will have spent an afternoon with them having read the complete revised manuscript. And, you know, if I were an ECR and were intelligent, I'd give us serious consideration. But I, I take the point, but we can't do everything. Um, and th this is the model we've chosen. We've tried to be as open to ECRs as we can be about it. Again, it fits with the IHR profile about what they're meant to be doing. It fits with what we try to do in terms of spending our discretionary income disproportionately on ECRs. And I, you know, there are other presses. Other, other, it's like a BBC statement. Other presses are also available. Um, but we pay their BPC. They do not pay a BPC with us. Where are they going to find that? Marco, as you showed us, you, you, you're producing physical books as well as uh, virtual objects, and you said the virtual objects, which are then finding a broad, broader global reach. What's the effect, since you, you did have the, uh, the old series, which is coming to an end, what's the effect in terms of um, sales or desirability of the physical object now that it exists in both formats? Yeah, um, there has been work done on this, um, and there's a, I think... We need, first of all, we need more data on that. I'm going to go back to my own UCL Press book because that exists, and this isn't actually out yet. This is a prototype. Um, I think we have sold uh, over 250 uh, paperback copies, maybe plus hardbacks of that. Now, that's a co-edited volume of 500 pages. I would not have expected in a year and a half to have shifted that amount, uh, that, that number of, of books. Um, I think, and I've actually I know this anecdotally, that the fact that people graze through the book and then think, God, I don't want to read a 500-page PDF, drives them to buy the book. Um, and I think, again, we need better data about that. But digital is better for some sorts of searching. Hard copy is better for others. Um, I still, in my seminars, the, in, when I give a... Um, a term-long seminar, part of the first session is spent with physical books on the table teaching students how to gut a book. And Martin, I think, made a really important point about you know, how cognitively we process different formats. I wish we had more better evidence about that. Some of the articles I've suggested suggest that it's old and creaky people like me for whom that's the case. But my impression, based on my own pedagogy, on my own teaching practice with these book exercises, is that students also interact differently, you know, 20 year olds interact differently if they have both and, not either or, particularly for longer forms. I think we might draw questions to a close there. Um, so I just thank Margaret again for her talk.